All right, uh, welcome to class, uh, CS 4510 lecture 14A. Today's the last day of our unit on computability theory. And starting uh, with then we have Tuesday off because it's uh, 4th of July. And then starting Thursday, that Thursday we'll talk about the unit on complexity. So now ends our discussion on the, on the possibility of computation. Next we'll talk about uh, computation comp uh, with respect to computational resources. The topic of this first half, 14A, is on what's called the recursion theorem, or uh, Kleene's recursion theorem. Exactly. Uh, same guy. I'm reading a book by him, and he doesn't call it Kleene's recursion theorem. He just calls it the recursion theorem, which is kind of humbling. Another thing about Kleene is that he never pronounced it. His father pronounced his name Kleene. His son pronounces his name Kleene. Kleene never pronounced his name Kleene. He pronounces his name Kleene, which is kind of weird. Kleene. So, yeah. So, Kleene's recursion theorem. That's. Is his name, so I guess he gets to say what he's called. Um, so uh, what the theorem actually says will take some building up. Uh, but first, let's ask a question. Uh, does there exist a Turing machine uh, which prints its own code. So, kind of a complicated question right off the bat. Have you ever heard of a quine? Quine? Quine, named after Willard Quine. Not William Quine, Willard Quine. A name you could make fun of, Willard. Um, quine, a quine is a program which prints its own code. So, uh, there's some rules involved. First off, it can't take in its own code as input. Otherwise, that would be kind of easy because then you have the, the distinction for us between a compiled program and the program as code is, is kind of arbitrary, but they're really like two programs then, right? Um, so, you can't read the code. You can't like compile the code and then have the compiled binary read the source code. That was, that's cheating. Um, it's also, so it's not allowed to take in any input. A quine is a program which prints its own code. It's not, not allowed to take any input, okay? So it seems, is this even possible? First off, it seems like, well, most Turing machines appear not to be quines because most don't appear to print their own code. They appear to do anything else. It's not even certain that such a quine exists. Um, what you can't do is something like this. And although I'm talking about Turing machines by Turing completeness, I'm just gonna use a general pseudocode style language. I can do like def, F, uh, a code takes on something, and then I say print code. Right, so Python 3-ish. Uh, and then I need to put the code here. So what would I put as the code? Def, uh, F, slash N, slash T, code takes on what? Oh, right. So there's a problem immediately. Um, you have what goes here. It goes uh, escape uh, quote def f, right? And you see we get some sort of re re recurrence uh, here. So you cannot hard code a program with its own code and then expect it to print it. It's not going to work. However, consider the program as a string, okay? We have a program which has coded its own code somehow and the program prints its own code. This string, although it is infinite and long and therefore this is not a program, it appears though that the, this code, this string, although infinite, is describably finite because it's just kind of like periodic. Um, so it appears maybe this, there's a way around this. Like maybe we don't have to hard code the code itself. Maybe we can compute the code. And uh, it turns out we can. It's a little, it's a little tricky from that. Um, so if you think about any sort of automated machine which is capable of building other machines. Like the first two examples people think of are for any biological system, uh, what is called osmosis, micro mitochondria, right there, everything doubles and splits. And right, so you have a cell, and it gets weird, right? And then eventually it's just, right? You can kind of, whoop, right? Cells do that and they duplicate all the parts inside and so on. Everyone remembers biology. So life is full of systems which are capable of self-replication. In fact, life, I think, is, might be defined by self-replication. I think viruses aren't classified as alive, but they're capable of self-replication, right? Something like this. So 
Um, certainly, every alive system appears to be self-replicable. Um, but what about machines? Um, uh, machines, do machines appear to be self-reproducing? So uh, what does it even mean? So like, if you have a machine which can, is capable of building other machines, like let's say you have a car factory and it produces cars, and maybe the car factory is like totally automated, right? A car does not produce cars, okay? Um, slight aside joke here, but there was a, like, I think it was a genetic, a genetics books for children, and it was trying to explain, like, reproduction to children. And the way it, it worded it, like, prehistoric people thought of it, is like, you take two humans, and then you, somehow you get a, a baby, but if you take two rocks and you smash them together, you'll get a small rock, right? So that's kind of a, a ridiculous analogy, but if you take two cars, you're not going to get a third car, right? Uh, you need a car factory to produce a car. But this is very different for, as a production system than a biological system because the car factory, by necessity, has to be more complicated than the car. The car factory specification contains within it the entire specification of the car, right? If, you, if I just gave you the factory and not the car and you were only allowed to look at it, you could probably reassemble a car just from looking at how all the parts are put together. So the factory appears to be more complicated uh, than the car is, right? So here seems maybe not a contradiction or a paradox, but something of the sort. Like if in order to produce an object, the object that is doing the production appears to be more complex than the object it can, is capable of producing. Um, yet biological systems are capable of reproduction in this way as well. So uh, you've ever played Horizon Zero Dawn in that game? I know it, but I never played it. It's the one with the... Um like robot dinosaurs? Yes. So the only reason I know is because it's the only time I've seen this trope. But there's like a, it's a tr common trope in science fiction where you have like, so basically, specific to Horizon Zero Dawn, you have these mechs that roam the planet and they're like, there's an alligator mech and there's a cougar mech and then there's deer mech and whatever. The mechs roam around, collect carbon, and they go back to what's called a cauldron. And the cauldron, they give the carbon to the cauldron and the cauldron then produces more robots. So the cauldron, and then it's like this level where you're, it's really dark and scary, but the, the, the cauldron is a cave which has no, it's totally autonomous, autonomous, and it produces these robots without stopping. So it's, the, the cauldron appears to be more complicated than the robots it's producing as well, right? It produces these mechs, but the cauldron is more complicated than the mechs. Um, so it's, it, 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 it doesn't appear, even like a 3D printer, like a 3D printer... Some of the parts of a 3D printer come 3D printed, but not all of it. Like, you still need the mel melting head and all these things, right? Those don't come. You can't 3D print a whole 3D printer, just most of a 3D printer. You still need probably 20, 30 bucks of parts. Um, yet, like, so to relate this back to computing, if a Turing machine is supposed to be, if there exists a Turing machine which is capable of printing itself, uh, so there's two ideas. One, is it more biological in that spirit, or is it more, like, mechanistic? Like, if it's more mechanistic mechanical, then just heuristically, I'm not saying this is like proven or anything, but if there did exist a device to print Turing machines, perhaps that di device should be more powerful than a Turing machine. Um, on the other case, if the, there did exist a Turing machine which prints its own code, it would be closer probably to something biological than it would be to something uh, mechanical. However, the Turing machine is a mechanical device like inspired biologically, right? So it turns out that do, there does exist uh, a Turing machine which prints it o its own code. And that's uh, kind of leading up to what is known as the recursion theorem. First, we're going to prove that there exists a Turing machine which does nothing except print its own code. Um, and then we'll prove it. So another like, evidence, I guess, in favor against the you need a stronger thing than a Turing machine to print a Turing machine is that there is nothing stronger than a Turing machine. So if there is a device capable of printing Turing machines, it better be a Turing machine, right? That's, the, uh, that's basically the statement. Um, so like it, going right off the bat from Python, there is, there's an immediate program that is capable of printing itself. And that is the empty program. Right? If you give an empty file to Python, the Python interpreter, it will do nothing. And then that's exactly what that program outputs. So congrats. We've, we've done it. Um, that's kind of boring, though. And that's kind of like a hard-coded ability into the interpreter itself. We don't really want to think about that. Um, 
So I'm looking for like a quote unquote non-trivial program or like a Turing machine, something more like a Turing machine, which is capable of doing something like this. Uh, the idea is that you can't do this, this uh, nested string hard-coded thing, but instead of storing the code in a program, what we're going to do is compute the code. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to have two programs. I'm going to call them helper and main. Okay. Helper is going to help main, and then main is going to help helper. Um, and combined, those programs are going to be the one program which prints its own encoding. Helper is going to print main. So a program, we appear to have trouble with a program printing itself. Fine. But programs are capable of printing other programs easily. Okay? You just hard code the other program as a string. You don't get the recurrence. So you don't get the infinite string, and then you're fine. So helper is going to print main, and then main is going to try and print helper. Immediately, there's probably a circularity issue, but we're going to resolve that. So I claim that helper is just quite simply going to print main. So I'm going to say uh, def helper. Helper is going to print main. And I'm going to call it m uh, takes on something. We don't know yet. Okay. Then I'm going to say print m. By the way, a lot of the paradigms in computation, especially for computability theory, are arbitrary. The difference between a compiled and an interpreted language, arbitrary. The difference between returning a string and printing a string, arbitrary. Why? Turing machine, return a string, the operation is just leaving the string on the tape. Printing a string is just writing it on the tape. And then, you know, these kind of distinctions don't really matter. It's, it, it's um, yeah. So that's what the helper function is going to do. Now, what is the main function going to do? The main function is going to, so, um, Helper prints m, but we want main to begin at least with its own encoding. So we want helper to give the code of main to main. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that like this. We're going to say m takes on helper. Okay. So m is I'm using h for the string encoding of helper, and I'll use m for the string encoding of main. So main is a program, but it's also going to be a string. And the string is going to be a code representation of the program, an encoding or godal numbering or so on. Uh, the helper is a function that's just hard-coded to print main. Okay? Here, we could not have helper hard-coded here. We could not say uh, h takes on something. right? You can't do that. Because uh, helper cannot hard-code main while main hard-codes helper. Right? Circularity issue, uh, very, really bad. So what we're going to do instead of this, helper is going to hard code main, fine. But then main is not going to hard code helper. What's instead is going to happen is that main is going to compute helper. What is helper? Helper is really just main with some stuff around it. So I claim instead of having hard coded helper, we're going to compute helper as follows. Uh, Basically what happens is the, is the function helper has three parts. It has everything that comes before, main, before the string main, main itself, and then everything that comes after the string main. Okay? Three strings are being concatenated here by this string concatenation operator. Okay? The def helper slash n slash t m equals back escaped quote is all this part. Similarly, then actually it should be here, right? Because it's not escaped. Similarly, everything that comes after the main is going to be here, right? So this is all this. This is this, the M. And this is this. Do we agree? Kind of convoluted, but now doing this construction, do we agree that h is a string representation of the program helper, or the function helper? So m is given its own encoding, 
using its own encoding, it's able to produce an encoding of the program which gave it its encoding. So there's a circularity. We're not out of the circularity woods yet, but basically, like, we're, we're okay, so like time travel, like, suppose a time machine did exist. Uh, whoever invented the time machine could then go back in time and give instructions on the time machine in the past, but that may change the future to prevent people from inventing the time machine because they already had a time machine, right? So in some sense, if the time machine did exist in that exact way, then everyone could have a time machine in a way that no one understood how it works because no one would uh, know how they got it. That's fine, kind of here. What's going on? That's kind of what's going on here. Main has access to its own encoding, but we don't know how yet. We haven't finished de describing helper. We just know that helper gives it main, gives it M, which is its own code. We haven't told it how it's going to do this yet. But this is main. So main, but main, if main was given its own code, we could certainly compute H. And then we're going to go back and fill in that, right? So now what do we have? Well, we have main has two strings. It has M, which is the string of which is the string returned by helper, which is the code of itself. Then it has H, which is the code of helper. But notice that helper and main are the entire program. Right? So we want main to print its own encoding. Right? We want main to print the code of the whole program. What is that going to look like? H is the code of helper. M is the code of main. So H plus M is the code of helper plus the code of main, which is the whole program. A little bit of work has to be done here in order to make sure that the control flow handoff is done correctly. I've called this one main, so we know that we started this function. Then I know this one is called this one calls helper, which is going to be this one. Uh, and then, then I know uh, like how that works uh, order wise. Um, but it's not if you you can word this slightly differently where it's not obvious about how the machines interact with each other and how that handoff occurs. For this example, luckily, I'm just going to say we can concatenate two codes. If you have two functions okay, of code, you can concatenate them. Congrats, you've concatenated a program with both functions in it. doesn't mean they're run, necessarily. Um, we're lucky that this works. Uh, well, it's defined to work, in, work out this way. Okay. So what's going to happen? Uh, let's suppose you run this program. Uh, if you run main, um, it's going to call... M, it's going to begin with its own encoding, M. Okay. M is now the code of main. I'll write it this way. I'll write it this way. Uh, then it computes H. It doesn't store H, it computes H from M, right? You notice that M really is just some slight wrapper around, excuse me, helper is a slight wrapper around M, and M is itself just the code of main, right? Um, so it's going to compute H from uh, helper. So this is going to be H, right? And then combined, those are going to be, of course, H plus M. Important thing I forgot to say is that we didn't fix helper, right? What we're going to do then, now that we know what M is, we're going to copy M and put it here. So M is going to go we can copy now we can copy that there uh, without having this recurrence here that we had for the infinite string. We can just copy this whole block of code here, and now we do not have a recurrence. Fair warning, I tried doing this in Python, so there's many quines on the internet um, in many languages. I tried to follow this is but it's not obvious looking at the quine why it works uh, this is a good explanation about why the quine works. But there are many, many, many programming issues when you run into try and do this because uh, you have to talk, think about escaped parentheses and escape, excuse me, escape quotations and so on. Because when you escape the quote, now you've inserted a new symbol. So then maybe like somewhere you have to escape the escape or something. It gets complicated. Um, it's totally solvable, but just know that there, there are some challenges. You know, Here I've also put uh, this as one line, a one line function, a string representing a function, but the function itself is not one line, right? So it depends on how when you type cat, 
does the terminal render this as a character as two characters, or does it actually do it? Or you know, it gets it gets slightly um, complicated. It's a, it, there are some computer technicalities that get in the way. In, in this, but in the spirit of the problem, we have now created a program that is capable of printing itself. That's the, really the main goal today, and everything is going to follow easily from that. Any questions on this? Does this you believe this prints itself? So there's two things you could do like in English before you had to ask about Turing machines. Um, here's a program in English that prints itself. Print this sentence. So print this sentence is a program which prints itself, right? So if you run this, if this was a program in some way, you print, you run it. It's capable of printing itself. Um, Okay, fine, but you don't know how to implement this. You can describe a high-level algorithm, but then press on the details, you should be able to implement it. It's not obvious how you implemented this call. Even though the programming languages do have like, like this dot, whatever, it's, that's a different this. This this is for this sentence itself, the program itself. So, But you can actually eliminate the self-reference in the English quote-unquote programming language by doing a similar structure here with two sentences that help each other. Um, so I can do this, print this, twice, second time, in quotes, print this twice, second time, in quotes. Classic example, right? This is a sentence that uh, says itself, right? Is that readable? I hope so. So print this twice, second time in quotes. Print this twice, second time in quotes. You run the program. It's going to look at the next string and then print it twice. The second twi time it's going to print it, it's going to print the quotes, right? In some sense, this line of the code is the helper. So this is like the helper. This is the main, and that's the one that computes the helper given access to its own code, right? So this is an example of like an English way to do it, to do the same thing uh, without the self-reference of this. Um, there's another thing, there's another idea here about the, uh, for all these things that we've done with, you know, total incompleteness with, with uh, the uh, halting problem and so on, is the, is the conflation of an idea of an object with the description of an object, right? So, you know, although Godel was prevented from talking, from creating sentences which talk about the truth value of themselves, he, there was nothing that stopped him from talking about the provability of themselves. And the proof of an object is simply a description related to the object. It's not, a, it's not the object itself. So here, there's a conflation of the program as a string and the conflation of a program itself. The second line is not a program. The second line is just a string. But it happens to be a quote, a description of the program itself on the first line. So kind of there's this kind of barrier here, this veil, this interplay between objects as strings and objects as, 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 as objects that allows us, we, we can sort of use that to peel around, uh, peel around this and get, get uh, a program that prints itself. This is the construction of a program that prints itself. So this is proof that there exists a program which prints itself. Um, now let's get on to the actual recursion theorem. So uh, the recursion theorem has many formulations, but here's the one we're going to use. A Turing machine uh, a Turing machine uh, may obtain a copy of its own uh, description. and compute with it. So there exists an instruction you can give to Turing machines, basically. And, it, and you can just tell the, the Turing machine can just say out loud, um, obtain a copy of my own code by the, by the recursion theorem. And then it proceeds to do something. So for example, we could have a machine uh, M on input uh, W. Here's how you would write it. 
uh, obtain uh, M uh, via, shouldn't be co here, this is the machine, machine, M on input W, obtain the code of M via the recursion theorem. Print uh, W, right? So what does this machine do? It basically, via the recursion theorem, it obtains its own code, and then it prints W. What's important here is that second line, obtain, co obtain uh, the code of M via the recursion theorem. You can just say that now. Now that we've proved... Um, well, what we're going to prove next is that you are allowed to do that, basically. Like, given, a, given a, an arbitrary Turing machine is allowed access to its own code. It, it doesn't read it from somewhere else. It doesn't take it. it doesn't, it's not necessarily takes the input. But by the nature of the, of the program itself, it's allowed to do that. It's allowed to compute this. This is possible. And then using its own description, it can do uh, certain things. Why is the recursion theorem useful? It's actually pretty niche, and it, it will make some proofs easier. But it's not that important, I think. It's not like the most phenomenal, amazing theorem, because in practice, what can a program do with its own code? Really, the only thing a program can do with its own code is try and derive contradictions, which is very useful for proofs in computability theory. It's not useful if you're actually designing an application or something. Right? Um, there are engineering challenges around that. Uh, so how are we going to do that? Uh, here's the proof of it. Basically, what happens, uh, and we'll prove it more rigorously, but basically what happens is, this is H, this is M. At the end, we just printed H plus M. But we didn't have to print H plus M. We could just store H plus M as a variable and then do with something with it. QED, that's the proof. Uh, instead, what we can do is a three, is a th is a three, um, a three code uh, program. Well, that's, that, that's basically the, the idea. So instead of a helper, so instead of, uh, instead of helper, and main, we're going to do uh, A, B, and T, right? So we're going to have A is going to print uh, on input uh, actually, what should I call this? On input uh, it's going to ignore its input. Trying to fix a, sy a syntax here that's decent. A, well, you know, I'll call these. Uh, we're going to call them helper, uh, main, and uh, T, uh, such that a T is allowed access to its own code. So we're going to allow T to compute with its own code as if it was receiving it from someone else. It's going to be able to compute T uh, that way. So what we're going to do, of course, is we're going to, this helper is going to be the same. So it's going to be def helper. Uh, it's going to print uh, mt takes on, and we'll go back and paste that in later. Print uh, mt. Uh, here we can put def uh, t on input w. Excuse me. Now we want to be able to call W. Uh, basically, we want to be able to call T. Excuse me, with T, it's the code of T as its own input. So we're going to say just say def uh, uh, T there, and then this is going to be something we don't know what. Then we're going to say def uh, main uh, on input W. It's going to do what? Uh, it's going to compute the helper. So it's an H is going to take on something plus uh, MT. It's going to take MT from helper. It's going to compute helper uh, using MT. And then it's going to compute HBT is equal to H plus BT. Then it's just going to call T. Go 
right? I really should move uh, T down here, though. Okay. So here's what happens again. Helper is a function. Now instead of returning main, it's going to return main and t, whatever t is. t is some machine. Uh, it's going to print empty, which is going to be the description of main plus the description of t. Okay. Main is going to be run uh, first, though, and it's going to begin with empty. Okay. It's going to begin with access to main plus this function we want to compute t. Okay. Main is going to compute h the same way uh, main computed h previously. It's going to compute the helper. Why? It has mt, which is its own code plus some, some other code. And it's, it's going to just compute helper the way we did previously. So it's going to have def, hel def helper, the name of the variable, and print, and so on. Right? And of course, you could make that smaller. Uh, so given mt, which is the code of m and the code of t, it's going to, prove, it's going to be able to compute h, which is the code of helper. Then it makes this variable hbt, which is helper b hbt. That was confusing. That was what it was. Hmt is helper main t, and it's going to be just take the code of helper and just add it to mt, right? Here we can do code as a string operation, a single string concatenation. But for more complicated ways, there may be some stitching you have to do for that. But this basically means you combine the two programs together. Yeah, right. Then we just pass, now HMT is the code of the whole program, including whatever the function T is. So we can just pass HMT now to T. So now T has a copy of its own code. T has HMT, which is the code of the program. The code is slightly different, though, because we have to add these helpers around. But T can compute with its own code and proceed. Right. So this is the recursion theorem. A, a, program is allowed access to its own, uh, own description and is allowed to compute with it. So I said earlier this was useful for proving theorems. Let's actually now just prove some theorems. We can use it to help us prove some theorems. I'll leave the definition of the recursion theorem up there. A Turing machine is allowed access to its own description and is able to compute with it. So what we're going to do now is basically the, the beauty of the recursion theorem is that so we proved di diagonal we proved that Cantor's diagonal argument was kind of there inside of um, Gödel's incompleteness and Turing's diagonalization and even Russell's um, paradox, uh, but. The recursion theorem is itself kind of a neatly packaged tool for recursion. So we can induce a kind of diagonalization argument by using the recursion theorem plus some sort of negation. That's sufficient for us to kind of, it's not a very formal way of saying this, but we're, we're able to, using the recursion theorem and some other kind of negation, we can induce a diagonalization proof. So we're going to prove, not by diagonalization, not by reduction, uh, ATM is undecidable. Assume uh, to, to the contrary, ATM is decidable. We give a machine M as follows. M on input W obtain the code of M via recursion theorem. So in this instruction, it now has stored as a variable the code containing the description of the machine. We haven't even finished describing the machine. But somehow, this instruction call, the machine is now able to read its own code. right? If m, w is in ATM, uh, reject. Else, what does this mean, else? Is, 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 is if m, 
I'm a W is in is not an ATM uh, except right. So it, certainly, if ATM is decidable, the acceptance problems for Turing machines. And, and recall that ATM, uh, if we forgot, is the set of machine and word encodings such that M accepts W. Right, similar to halt. Uh, we assume to the contrary that ATM is decidable. Give a decider for it. Suppose there exists a decider for it. And here we're going to run M comma W on the decider. So M runs the code of M. It's going to ask the decider, am I going to halt on this input? And if the decider says yes, M is going to decide to say no. If, just to be clear what's happening here. M has its own code. It goes and asks the decider, am I going to halt on this input? And if it says yes, it will not halt. Excuse me, it will, if it says I'm going to accept, it will not accept. So it's specifically, you know, like imagine an oracle or like a, a witch or something tells you, you know, you're going to get married on a Friday. And then because of that information, you now choose not to do that. You choose to do, given the information about the future, you choose to change it. Basically what happens, uh, you induce a certain contradiction here. So like M, M comma W uh, is in ATM. If M comma W is in ATM, that's true if and only if uh, M accepts W. But if M accepts W, then the accept instruction was reached, which could only have been reached if M comma W was not in ATM. Contradiction. Right. This string m comma w cannot be in ATM and not in ATM simultaneously. Right. Similarly, if m comma w, I'll just write it out. If m comma w was not in ATM, uh, that's true if and only if m rejects or loops uh, on w. But if m rejects or loops on w, M only has a reject instruction. So this reject instruction had to be reached from M on W. But if the reject instruction was reached, it's only reached on the conditional if M comma W is in ATM. We know that that, in, that, that that conditional has to be satisfied. So that's true only if M comma W was in ATM. Same contradiction, right? OK, so given the recursion theorem is true, uh, we are, and it is true, we're able to show that ATM is undecidable. So notice here that we do have a negation, which is this in it. If it's in it, I'm not. If it's not in it, I am. Uh, and then we have the self-reference happen all neatly packaged by this one instruction by the recursion theorem. It's quite clean for us to do this way, do it this way. So it, is, it at least appears to be quite useful for proofs. There's a more classic presentation of the fixed point theorem, and we're just going to introduce it as a lemma, uh, excuse me, of, of the recursion theorem. Are you familiar with a fixed point? You know what a fixed point of a function is? Maybe you've, heard, maybe you've heard of Brouwer's fixed point theorem. A fixed point of a function is for f. Uh, f has a fixed point if um, there exists x uh, such that uh, f of x is equal to x. So, like, there is a function that there. If a, a function is a map from object to object, set of objects to set of objects. Uh, a function is a fixed point if the map itself does not transform one element, right? A permutation is, of course, not doesn't a, a fixed point of a permutation. Of course, is an element that isn't mapped. Um, but certain functions, so permutations don't in general have fixed points. But there are some kinds of functions which unavoidably have fixed points. Like you can prove that any function of this kind has a fixed point. Usually, it has to do with continuity because usually when you map something to something back. There has to be some intersection or something, and there has one. Therefore, there has to be one. There has to be one element uh, that wasn't that didn't follow the rules. Basically, it didn't have, uh, by whatever continuous properties of the object you're studying. Um, it turns out that there is uh, by the recursion theorem there is an analog analogous fixed point theorem for uh, uh, the computable functions. So basically, like. Um, uh, for uh, T, any uh, transformation uh, from Turing machines to Turing machines, a computable transformation. So T is a computable transformation. 
What that means is it takes an input of Turing machine and outputs a Turing machine. Like you don't want it to make any syntax errors. The tr it, the, it's computable because there exists a Turing machine to compute uh, whatever this function t is. A transformation could be anything. A transformation could be somehow it renames the variables, rewrites the code, swaps the accept and reject states. It can do anything. Um, uh, for for any transformation uh, of Turing machines to Turing machines, uh, there exists a machine M uh, such that uh, there is there is a machine where under the transformation, uh, the language recognized by the machine does not change. So you operate T on the set of all Turing machines. One of the machines will not change its behavior. It seems crazy because it feels like in a permutation kind of setting, if you have an infinite amount of elements, you should be able to reorder them in a way such that one of them doesn't map to the other, doesn't stay the same. But it doesn't say this code doesn't stay the same. It just says the behavior doesn't change. It, says the, it doesn't say the code doesn't change. The code will change. It just, but it does say that the behavior won't. So uh, another way to word this, if uh, M1, M2, M3 is some ordering, is an ordering of all uh, TMs, and F is a reordering, such as like M of F1, M of F2, M of F3. So F you can think of as a reordering of the Turing machine. So M1 goes to whatever. Now the first Turing machine in the ordering is going to be F1, M of F1, okay? Something like this. You can even suppose F ignores the Turing as a transformation. You can think of F ignores the Turing machine and just always returns the same Turing machine. It could be ridiculous like that. It doesn't have, so given all the Turing machines, maybe it only returns some of them, okay? Um, for any reordering like this, uh, there exists I such that the language of MI is equal to the language of M of FI. And using that kind of notation, it seems a little bit more like a fixed point, right? So you perform this transformation, this reordering, and somehow you're still left with the same machine. Excuse me, this, the, the machine may be different, but the behavior of the machine is unchanged uh, with respect to what power, what kind of strings it decides. So... Some two quick examples, like it doesn't seem to be true, but the two examples I can come up with at the top of my head uh, appear to have this property. First, as a transformation, consider the identity function. That is a fixed point. Every element is a fixed point. Okay, fine. Consider the transformation which swaps the accept and reject states. What is a fixed point of that transformation? So every element doesn't map to itself. Yes. So suppose, suppose that T uh, swaps... Uh, QA and QR, right? It attempts to produce the complement of the language. Uh, T is this transformation which swaps the accept and reject states. Can you give me a fixed point such that, give me a machine such that uh, before and after you perform the swap, it has to recognize the same language? So you have a function say f of x equals x. Yes. And the complement is f of x equals not equal to x. So the function itself is not true for, it's not that every element is a fixed point, but that just there exists one x, which is a fixed point. It might swap everything else, but it, there's guaranteed to be one element it doesn't work on. This magic doesn't work on. So I'm asking you, give me a Turing machine such that if you were to swap the accept and reject states, nothing changes. So it's equal to its complement. Ah, so here's the that's the that's the trick. It can't be equal to its complement. So uh, 
this would not be true for just the decidable Turing machine, certainly, because if you did a swap the accept and reject, and the machine always guaranteed was guaranteed to hit the accept or the reject, then certainly it would always ex then it would the transformation would the language of the transform transform Turing machine would be the complement. Fine, but choose a Turing machine which doesn't accept or doesn't reject. It loops. So consider a Turing machine uh, M uh, on input uh, W a loop. So on all inputs, it just loops. It never reaches the accept or reject state. What is the language of M here? It's going to be the empty set, right? Because it accepts no strings. It doesn't reject any strings either. It just loops on all of them. But a machine is in, a word is only in the language of accept. So we say it loops on a string, if we know it loops on a string, and we say it's not in the language either. If this loops on all strings, it doesn't accept any of them. Swap the accept and reject states. Fine, it still doesn't reject any, it never rejected any strings, so it doesn't accept them now. So it's still the empty, empty, uh, empty set. Right. It's kind of sneak, sn snuck in there because this looping idea is a, a secret third thing besides the uh, true and false. Basically, it's like a, uh, it, it's really where what makes this possible, right? It's the only thing that makes this possible. Uh, so now let's just prove it. It's really easy to prove, actually. It's surprisingly easy. Uh, basically, what you're going to do is compute the transformation and then simulate it. Uh. So the fixed point is going to be f. Uh, we'll say let t uh, be our transformation, our computable transformation. We give the fixed point. Not only are we going to uh, say that there exists a fixed point. Actually, some fixed point theorems are non-constructive because it doesn't tell you what the fixed point actually is. This fixed point theorem appears to be constructive because we're actually going to give the, the fixed point, and we're going to call it f on input uh, w. What we're going to do is obtain f, f uh, via the recursion theorem. Uh, we're going to compute uh, the code of G to be equal to the transformation of F. So given our own code, we perform, T is computable. So they're just a Turing machine to compute T. So we can just run, we obtain our own code and we compute the transformation of our own code. And we call that G. Um, okay. Simulate. G. So this simulate call, we're going to do whatever G does. G accepts, we accept. G rejects, we reject. G loops, we're still going to loop. We're just going to do what it does, right? Um, so notice, though, that like um, since F simulates G, F is just going to do exactly what G does on W. I'll say G on W. Um, so F simulates G. So if F accepts G, F accepts G only if G accepts G. Excuse me, F accepts W only if G accepts W. So since F simulates G, we can say that the language of F is equal to the language of G. Right? But G, as computed, is just the transformation of F. So G is just the transformation of F. Okay, that's it. Right here we have L of F. Right. F is the machine under the transformation. T uh, does not change the language it decides or uh, recognizes. It does change perhaps its behavior. Maybe it takes longer or whatever. It doesn't matter. But it certainly will reach the accept if it was meant to, reject if it was meant to, loop if it was meant to. OK, I have one final application of the recursion theorem. Um, we're going to reprove Rice's theorem uh, just using the recursion theorem. We previously proved it by reduction. Uh, and there's probably a proof out there of diagonalization. But I'm going to prove it. Uh,
uh, using um, the recursion theorem. So recall uh, that Rice's theorem says uh, P is the language of the set of encodings of Turing machines such that uh, M has uh, the property. And uh, Rice's theorem, if uh, the property is semantic and non-trivial, then uh, P is undecidable, right? So if a property of Turing machines has to do with the language and it's non-trivial, it's undecidable, right? If the machine loops, if it accepts, um, if it halts, if it accepts 1001, if it has an infinite language, if it's, it's closed under reversal, and so on. All these, all these machines uh, are... Um, all these languages are undecidable. So here's the proof. Uh, suppose... Uh, the P is decidable since there exists, since uh, the property is non-trivial, uh, there exists M1 in P, so M1 has the property, and M0 hasn't the property, right? There exists a machine with the property, and there exists a machine without the property. We're going to call this machine R uh, on input uh, W. It's going to obtain uh, the code of R by recursion theorem. Uh, if R has the property, we're going to make sure that we don't have the property simulate uh, M0 on W. If R doesn't have the property, simulate M1 on W. So does R have the property or does R not have the property? Well, let's say. Suppose R Suppose R has the property. Suppose R is in the property P. If R is in the property P, uh, then R is going to simulate uh, M0. So the languages that are, the strings that are accepted by R are going to be exactly the strings that are accepted by M0. But um, M0 is not in the property. So, uh, and since the property is semantic, that means that R is not in the property. Similarly, if uh, R hasn't the property, then R, uh, if R doesn't have the property, R is going to simulate M1. So the language accepted by uh, uh, R is going to be equal to the language accepted by M1, because it's going to copy the behavior of M1 on W. But if it simulates M1, except all the same strings, uh, but uh, M1 has the property by our assumption. But since M1 has the property, that implies that R has the property. Similar contradiction. If it doesn't have the property, if it does have the property, it doesn't. If it doesn't have the property, it does. So no, notice here we did kind of a diagonalization style argument where we the whole self-reference is nicely packaged by the machine being accessed to its own encoding. We don't have to do anything smart there. Uh, and then simply we branch differently based off what we should do to what we shouldn't. Uh, the undecidable language gives us a power to, to, uh, for us to deviate from what is respectable. And from there, we can conclude we did something we weren't supposed to. So certainly, we shouldn't be allowed to have that power. 
Uh, this is a proof of Rice's theorem following uh, the proof of the recursion theorem. I actually think the reduction proof is about probably the same difficulty. This one requires you to know what the recursion theorem is to prove it. So that is the recursion theorem. Uh, we're actually going to need this. The whole point of this was just so we could use it for one thing, one proof uh, next lecture. It makes the next lecture kind of easy. Um, any questions? It's like a general question. Maybe it should have been asked much earlier. But when you make your functions for these problems, you get to decide what to simulate on for which if condition? Yes. So couldn't you, like, how do you know? You could just as have, well have simulated M1 on W. Here? Yeah. Simulate F0? Yes, you could, but then you wouldn't reach a contradiction. Right, so how do you know? So recall the halting problem. We gave, a, we gave an example of a machine, and then we ran the machine on its own code. That was the only way we were able to derive a contradiction. We could still build the machine and then run it on something else and not get a contradiction. Right, okay, so you just have to pick one. Yes. This program R doesn't do anything, okay? It just exists only to induce this inconsistency. It doesn't actually solve any problem. It's just there as a counterexample, right? It's uselessly, you know, it doesn't have any, any ability. We, if I had M1 and M0, if I swap these two instructions, um, I would make a program that does not derive a contradiction and is useless. I want, the, I want to at least derive the contradiction, certainly. But could you, could you make some nonsense machine that gives you a contradiction for something that you know is true? Um, to rephrase what you're asking, in, without assuming anything to the contrary, could you produce an inconsistency? Right. Well, we know that the axioms of set theory are, are not provably consistent. Oh, but we right. don't appear to be able to derive. We can derive statements which appear independent, like the continuum hypothesis, but we don't appear to derive anything strict. We would, we certainly, the, the system appears consistent and conservative, but it doesn't appear, it certainly, it would be very bad if it appeared inconsistent. If you have zero equals one, you can throw that into any proof. If you could provably true, prove, prove zero equals one, add that into any proof and you can prove anything you want, right? It's just, sure. it's, we would hope something like that doesn't work. Um, this contradiction, of course, can only be possible by the fact that P was decidable. Here's the assumption there. P is decidable. Right. When we test, here's this line. When we say P, R is in P, we're really, really the way we should word this and the way other people word this, but I don't, is that assume to the contrary that P is decidable, then there exists a decider, and then we would call it something. Let's say we call it D. And then we would say, well, we run R on D, which is the decider for P. And then what does, whatever it does, then we branch. So we, this line here that says R and P, we're really asking the decider for P that we assume to the contrary exists what to do. Oh, right. So you're saying if there was a decider, you can make a whole bunch of junk. Exactly. Right. That's the contradiction. And notice that R, the construction of R is conditional on if that decider existed. I can actually draw the picture for this, I think. So let's call, let's keep that up. Let's call that decider D that we assume to the contrary exists. Uh, we're going to obtain our own code. We're going to ignore our input, and we're just going to obtain via the recursion theorem our own code. We're going to give that to D, and then whether or not what we do is what we, I'll draw it this way. Did this make any sense? I don't think, I think this diagram makes it worse. D, we take, uh, we take a copy of our own code via the recursion theorem, give it to this decider. If it says yes, we're going to make sure we say no. And if it says no, we're going to make sure we say yes. Right? And we take whatever our input was, W, and we just simulate M M0 or M1 on W. Right? So we pass that all the way through. This was what it might look diagram di di diagrammatically. And it exists, this machine R exists. It's built only around D. It's only, the assumption here is that D exists, so that's why it exists. No problem. Great question. Great question. Let me get this in the shot before I end the video. That's the diagram.